Welcome back everyone, it's time for the next chapter of our video series. For those who are new, make sure to watch the previous episode first, you'll find the link down below. In this video, we'll be recapping the 3 and 4 episodes, so let's get started with episode 3. Sharon, James, Eva, and the others gathered in the meeting room to discuss their water filtration system. It worked as it should, but Eva broke the news. Our water supply would be limited to 6 days after filtration, which was a shock to all of them. Sharon, always full of optimism, was confident that we would get through this challenge, but not everyone was. Most of them were reeling from the threat of water shortage, their worries centered around their own survival. Sharon then announced that we would be having our rations going forward due to a lack of drinking water. This was a disappointment to some of the crew, who had been bombarded with grim news since walking. Spencer reprimanded Sharon for creating fear, saying it was counterproductive. Sharon, however, stood her ground on transparency, saying that everyone needed to know about the water crisis. However, in the midst of these heated discussions, Eva discovered an even more serious problem. The spaceship's cooling system was shutting down, resulting in engine failure. Eva had disabled the cooling system. She had prioritized drinking water over maintaining the spaceship. Recognizing the importance of water for human life, Eva had stressed the need to provide for the crew's immediate needs. Spencer objected to this choice, but Sharon supported it. We're scientists, she said, not soldiers. They considered reaching out to the solar system but were too far away from any such system. With the spaceship are completely stopped, restarting the motor without the necessary water was impossible. All the water needed to start the cooling system had been wasted. They had no other option but to find water in the universe or face certain doom. They were even more horrified when they realized there are no nearby planets to draw water from. In the middle of this heated discussion, a computer alarm goes off. James grimly reports that, in addition to the impending water crisis, they are facing another immediate danger. A meteor is on course to crash into their spaceship in the next six hours, and they don't have the resources to alter the ship's trajectory. This adds to their already dire situation. In a last-ditch effort to survive, they contemplate the daring option of venturing into space through the airlock without protective suits. Despite the severity of their situation, there is still a spark of hope among them, rooted in their shared identity as scientists who can find solutions. Back on the bridge, tensions rise as Felix confronts Spencer about the ongoing investigation into Jasper's murder. Furious at being distracted from the imperative of saving the ship, Spencer vents his frustration at the need to focus on the murder investigation. Felix's confidence in his suspicions about Spencer's involvement increases, especially regarding Spencer's knowledge of the knife found by botanist Angus. Spencer explains to Felix that Angus told everyone about the knife, ending any pretense of confidentiality. He urges Felix to leave the bridge, stressing the importance of concentrating on the immediate situation at hand. However, Felix responds that such issues are normal for spaceships and will likely continue to occur in the future. Sharon intervenes on Spencer's behalf, agreeing that this is not the time for an investigation. Felix reluctantly leaves the bridge, and the focus shifts to the impending collision, now known to everyone on board. Eva's attempts to restart the cooling system fail. Dr. Kabir is in the med bay, exhausted but determined, going over the crew's medical records. James is missing from the reports, and she goes to him to ask for more tests. James dismisses her worries, confident that their fate will be decided within the next six hours. Kabir, however, insists on testing them if they survive past the deadline. Later, Baylor and Alice talk about the impending asteroid impact, with Alice regretting the missed opportunity to explore the new planet Proxima B. Baylor encourages Alice by reminding her of her heroics in the oxygen crisis and encouraging her to try again. Encouraged, Alice heads out to investigate the asteroid in the hope of finding a solution. Later, Sharon gathers everyone on the bridge including Angus, who is eager to share his thoughts. Angus jokes about pushing the spaceship, like a car to start. Inspired by Angus's humor, James, remembering his experience as an ex-pilot, thinks they can push the spaceship along the asteroid's path without starting the main engine. Fortunately, Arc-1 is also equipped with a shuttle with its own engine, so James suggests using the shuttle's engine to maneuver the spacecraft with its thrusters away from the asteroid. The group rejoices at this plan's success. Upon boarding the shuttle, James realizes that the system is malfunctioning. Angus admits to removing some of the shuttle's components for their biofarm, not knowing that they will need the shuttle in the future. This revelation means the shuttle also requires repairs. Sharon dispatches the maintenance team to James to retrieve the missing parts taken by Angus. They find the parts and reinstall them, only to find that Angus has tangled them in some way, making it complicated to start the engine. Time is running out, so they decide to look for an alternative solution. During a follow-up meeting, Spencer and Sharon consider blowing up a part of the spacecraft to slightly change its trajectory. However, 
obtaining explosive devices proves to be a significant challenge. Angus proposes that he can manufacture explosives using fertilizers. With this new plan in place, James concentrates on the idea of a shuttle thruster. Sharon, Angus, and Ava focus on making explosives. Meanwhile, Dr. Kabir learns that some of the medicine was stolen from his laboratory. Later, Sharon, Spencer, and Angus arrive at the part of the spaceship they plan to set off the bomb, where they run into a rowdy group of teenagers who have stolen the drug from Dr. Kabir's laboratory. Sharon orders them to stop and get out of the area as soon as possible. One of the teens challenges Sharon's authority, claiming they never consented to working on the spaceship, and Sharon reminds them that, until they get to their destination, they are all crew members and must follow orders. Sensing Sharon's determination, the rest of the teens comply and leave. Eva and Angus plant the bomb in the designated spot, but Sharon wonders if the blast will be powerful enough to affect the spaceship's trajectory because of the asteroid's size. Upon inspecting the system, it turns out that the blast was powerful enough to change the trajectory, much to everyone's delight. Meanwhile, James successfully repairs the shuttle, but remains unaware of the resolution of the asteroid issue. As the crew struggles with a six-day supply of water, the rest of the crew observes the asteroid passing by. Then, out of nowhere, Alice notices something strange. The asteroids have a tail, meaning they are actually comets. She runs to the bridge and tells James about her discovery, but leaving her tablet behind with Baylor. At the same time, Baylor begins to examine the contents of Alice's tablet, the consequences of which will be revealed later. Alice explains to James how comets, as opposed to asteroids, have a tail of ice, which means they contain water. James quickly realizes that if they can get water from the comets, then their water crisis will be over. The crew engages in a discussion about potential solutions, and Ava suggests utilizing their shuttles to extract water from the comet through ship-to-ship -ship refueling. James eagerly steps forward, volunteering for the mission, accustomed to putting his life on the line for the sake of the crew. However, connecting the spaceship arc with the comet poses a significant challenge. They must match the comet's speed and direction precisely. With the shuttle repaired, James gears up for the task ahead. They devise a plan to use the shuttle's thruster instead of the spaceship's engine, eliminating the need for the spaceship's engine altogether. James will pilot the shuttle to land on the comet, with Ava leading the effort to bring water back to the spaceship. As they finalize preparations for departure, Ava appears hesitant, expressing doubts and asking James several questions. James reassures her, cracking a joke to ease the tension, and asking if she's worried about him. Ava clarifies that her concern is for the safety of the crew as a whole, not just James personally. While James's piloting experience is appreciated by Baylor and the rest of the crew, there are questions about why he was demoted from a pilot to a navigator. In the midst of all this chaos, James gets ready for the mission. He matches the spaceship's speed with the speed of the comet and gets ready for the difficult journey ahead. Despite his calm demeanor, the crew on board is tense. They land successfully on the cometary surface, and James begins collecting water while Eva's team begins extracting it. Although he has only collected 90% of what is needed, James continues to collect water until he reaches 100%, ignoring the danger of the breaking pipe and the pleas of his crewmates to turn back. James is determined to make sure the spaceship has full water before they leave. When James returned to the spacecraft, they are greeted with a round of applause and cheering. They are hailed as heroes for their bravery and determination. In their excitement, they consume the water without first testing it, a dangerous mistake. Despite the difficulties, once the cooling system is up and running and the water is secure, they are able to start the spaceship and get back on track. Sharon orders Spencer to inform the crew that water is available, which brings joy and relief to everyone as they celebrate this important development. Ava is overcome with emotion, and Kat shares a personal story about her past with her. Kat reveals that she suffered from UV radiation during one of her previous space missions, which caused her to use a wig to cover her hair loss. Eva confides in Kat about how she feels about Jasper for his part in Harris's death feeling closure now that he has suffered the consequences. In the meantime, Spencer gets a secret message that hints at something hidden in one of the sleeping quarters. And upon investigation, she finds footage of Sharon getting into a fight in a Florida bar where she shot a man to death. This raises questions about Sharon's character and motivations, which will be explored further in the upcoming episode. And that is how episode 3 comes to a close. In the beginning of fourth episode, afterward, following this discovery, Spencer and his partner Felix confront her on the bridge and tell everyone to leave. Sharon is confused and asks for an explanation. Felix says they found Jasper's killer. Felix then shows her a tablet with footage of her being involved in a fight in a bar that resulted in a man's death. Shocked, Sharon denies any involvement in the incident and claims she doesn't know anything about it. Spencer accuses her of being Jasper's killer, citing a possible motive and implying she silenced him in order to keep her secret. Although Sharon pleads not guilty, 
Spencer remains firm in his conviction, pointing out the evidence. Even Felix is skeptical and orders her to stay in her quarters until further investigation. With no one else to help her, Sharon is left to face the accusations and discover the truth behind those incriminating footage. Following Sharon's arrest, Felix, Spencer, and James assemble to address the situation. Spencer immediately voices his deep-seated suspicions regarding Sharon and proposes disclosing her alleged crimes to the entire crew, advocating for the removal of her leadership position. However, Felix interjects, pointing out the limitations of the evidence. It was recorded on Earth, not on the spaceship, rendering it inconclusive. He urges caution, stressing the need for a thorough investigation before reaching any conclusions. Spencer grows increasingly frustrated by Felix's cautious approach, highlighting the significance of the evidence and Jasper's possible motives for recording it. James, adopting a neutral stance, refrains from fully aligning with either Spencer or Felix, indicating his readiness to weigh all available information before making a decision. After leaving the conference room, Felix sees a strange man holding a baby in his arms. The baby's crying disturbs Felix, and the man disappears in front of him. Shaking his head, Felix returns to his duties and goes to question Sharon. Sharon pleads not guilty, saying she was at a friend's house in London at the time of the recording. She begs Felix to check her alibi with the date and place of the recording. Despite Sharon's plea, Felix continues his questioning, intent on finding out the truth behind Jasper's murder. James visits Angus at the bio shelter and takes him into the airlock. James tells Angus about the crystalline material left behind from the spaceship crash that caused burns on Angus's hand upon contact with the material. James mentions the gloves that were left behind and urges Angus to look into the nature of this material further. Initially hesitant, Angus didn't want to go it alone, so he asked James if he could talk to a scientist. James jokingly said no, and urged Angus to use his wits. For made a bomb out of fertilizer once, he said, and I know a thing or two about chemical reactions. Angus was feeling a bit overwhelmed by work, but he agreed to investigate anyway, especially since he thought there might be a link between the mysterious stuff causing the destruction of his farming vegetables. Later, Spencer walks through the cooling system chamber and runs into James, who is worried about Sharon. She could be in serious trouble, he says, and she could be a threat to everyone on this ship. Spencer is taken aback by James's sudden change in attitude towards Sharon and is left wondering why he is so hatred towards her suddenly. Meanwhile, Felix keeps seeing a strange man and a girl who aren't part of the spaceship's crew. Every time he tries to talk to them, they disappear. Feeling worried about these strange experiences, Felix talks to Kat about it. He tells her that he feels like he's going crazy because he keeps seeing visions of Robert and his daughter. Confused, Kat asks, who is Robert? Felix explains that Robert is his husband. Kat realizes why Felix was hesitant to go with her earlier. She tries to comfort Felix, but he feels frustrated and scared, thinking he's losing touch with reality. Kat tells Felix that others on the spaceship have experienced similar things, maybe because they've been together for so long. She suggests that being stuck in the same place for a long time might be making them feel this way. Kat tells Felix to take a break and look after himself. In the medical bay, Dr. Kabir is busy treating a patient, struggling to stay awake due to lack of sleep. She relies on special pills to help her stay alert. Suddenly, she notices her boss, head Dr. Halls, approaching her. Meanwhile, on the bridge, Spencer and James are discussing Sharon. James suggests a drastic solution, eliminating Sharon so Spencer can take control of the spaceship. Spencer is shocked by James's suggestion, finding it disturbing. However, things take a strange turn when the real James appears, making Spencer realize that he had been imagining James's presence all this time. This revelation highlights the growing issue of hallucinations affecting the crew members on the spaceship. Another crew member faints in the medical bay and is quickly placed on a bed to be examined by Dr. Kabir. Dr. Kabir is perplexed by the crew member's sudden symptoms, but she is determined to do tests to determine what is causing them. In the cafeteria, Alicia and Baylor are conversing, and it is clear that they are fond of each other. Baylor and Dr. Kabir are both having hallucinations. Dr. Baylor sees capped Susan, and Dr. Abigail sees an imaginary version of her own mother. Each time they have these bizarre visions, the characters they see either encourage them, scare them, or encourage them to do something. Meanwhile, Dr. Felix is obsessively analyzing data, especially video footage. In the middle of his analysis, he hears a crying baby, but decides to ignore it and concentrate on proving Sharon's innocence. He is determined to prove Sharon's story and test her claims that she is not the person on the incriminating video footage. However, the resemblance is uncanny, leaving Felix puzzled as to who the person in the video is and casts doubt on the authenticity of the footage. Back on the bridge, James is caught in a nightmare in which Dr. Kabir appears in front of him, trying to take a sample of his blood for testing. In a fit of panic, James screams until he breaks free from the nightmare, only to find himself facing Alicia, 
As the rest of the crew struggle with their own bizarre hallucinations, it becomes clear that something strange is happening on board the spaceship. One person stands out and unaffected from any type of hallucination. Later, during a visit to Sharon to find the truth behind the incriminating footage, she hesitates to reveal the sensitive information she holds back. But after a moment of thought, she opens up to Felix and reveals a closely held secret. She and her twin sister, Dennis Garnett, are cloned. Their genetic makeup has been carefully altered to improve their abilities for space missions, giving them abilities beyond what ordinary humans possess. Unfortunately, changes to Dennis's genetic code have left him prone to violent behavior, making Sharon the only viable candidate for the crucial mission. Sharon admits that the person in the incriminating video is Dennis, not her. Furious at having been kept in the dark about Sharon's true identity until now, Felix extends his apologies for his doubts and accepts her explanation. In the conference room, Sharon is brought in by Felix, which surprises Spencer, who asks why she's there and why he's saying she's innocent. He tells her the information is private, but Spencer is skeptical. James comes in and asks about the identity of the killer, but Felix tells him that he's still investigating. Spencer sees James struggling with hallucinations, which angers him and reminds him that he should have killed Sharon earlier. Dr. Kabir is worried about the growing danger and fears for the safety of everyone on the ship. At some point, Eva confesses to Kat that she's the murderer of Jasper, and Kat is shocked. Eva begs him not to tell anyone, but she won't let her go. Out of desperation, Eva grabs a knife, thinking she might hurt herself, but she doesn't. It turns out she was hallucinating, and the events didn't happen. In the next scene, Angus is working inside the bio shelter when suddenly Sharon appears in front of him. Although Angus has feelings for Sharon, he quickly realizes that the it is hallucination, not real. He connects the hallucinations with the comet water and rushes to the med bay to inform Dr. Kabir. But before he can explain his findings, he collapses and goes into a coma. When Dr. Kabir sees Angus in this state, she realizes that he was trying to tell her something important about the water. Quickly she investigates and finds that the water contains special molecules that have a deep impact on the brain. This discovery reveals a huge difference between the water on the planet and the water on Earth, which has been consumed by all the crew members without proper testing. In the meantime, Sharon, who is not affected by these hallucinations, tells Dr. Kabir that she is a clone and that her strong immune system could be the key to finding a cure. Realizing the urgency, Dr. Kabir secretly collects Sharon's blood samples in order to use them as a potential treatment. But before she can do so, Dr. Kabir falls down and loses consciousness. Sharon finds a tube stuck in her hand that contains important information that Alice has deciphered. Inside are enzymes that can neutralize the bad molecules in the comet water. Realizing how urgent the situation is, Alice suggests using these enzymes directly in the drinking water, which is a collective approach to treatment instead of treating each case individually. James, trusting in Alicia's decision, agrees. The treated water is quickly distributed and ingested by the crew, as they begin to recover from their hallucinations. Ava, however, is hesitant to take part in this new water regimen, as her hallucinations include visions of Harris, someone she feels emotionally attached to. Despite Kat's warnings about the potential consequences, Eva finally gives in and drinks the treated water. The experience makes the crew realize how important it is to thoroughly test any alien substance before consuming it, whether it's water or any other material, in order to prevent similar occurrences in the future. With the situation resolved and the crew feeling calm and relieved to be back on the spaceship, Angus comes across a surprising discovery about the crystal. He rushes to the bridge and warns everyone not to bring any more unidentified objects aboard the spacecraft. James and Sharon are quick to understand the significance of Angus's warning. Angus explains that the element found inside the crystal is very unusual and appears to have weapon-like properties instead of typical asteroid material properties. This revelation sends shockwaves through the crew, who are left wondering what kind of dangers are out there in the vast universe. Angus explains that he can't determine if the weapon was human in origin, further complicating the situation. And with that, episode 4 comes to a close.